on this edition of Independent Sources, Black Boys in School, How Race Still Plays a Role in the Education Achievement Gap. That it's not just about making the environment better for minority students, but that by talking about race, we are, are bettering the entire society and the entire community. And Adventures in the Tech Sector, an entrepreneur helps foreign-based companies become part of New York's new technology initiative. It's people like that, it's, you know, founders of Google from Russia that are, that are building these great, inspiring companies that are changing the world. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Sarah Pizon. The achievement gap between minorities and whites has been a long documented narrative. A new film, American Promise, is the latest chapter in this ever-evolving story about how race and socioeconomics impact black males in particular. The film took nearly 14 years to make and tracks the progress of two African-American boys from kindergarten through high school graduation. It's already garnered critical accolades at the 2013 Sundance Festival. Gary Pierre Pierre sat down with the film's director, Michelle Stevenson, to talk about the impact race the still has on education. Community. Before we start this conversation, Michelle, let's take a look at a clip from the movie American Promise. Idris, yeah? tell me about your girlfriend. I don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> you can just shy. I'm not shy. Uh, shy. Idris is extremely bright. Shayon's creativity is exceptional. What we teach in Dalton is to teach them they have a voice. It's my best school and I love it there. I would like to be a professional basketball player when I grow up. I want Shayon to be comfortable around white folks. Because I think even at this point, I am not comfortable around white folks. How do you feel about being one of the few black kids there? Is that ever an issue? No, it's never an issue. Good try, Idris. Dalton will open doors for him for the rest of his life. You see the inauguration? At one point, I was thinking what we're doing could pay off in something like this. Not that I want you to be the president of the United States. I'm not going really good in school. You get really frustrated. My basketball team, they said, oh, you talk like a white boy. They told us that our son is a hard to manage guy. They don't know him. There's a cultural disconnect between independent schools and African-American boys, and the question is why. I hate school. It's bad. It's hard. The problem is focusing on class. After you leave Dalton, where do you go? I really don't want to leave. I don't think it was, frankly, a good match for him. I'd be better off if I was white. Isn't that true? This is unacceptable. Sit up! It's laziness. Something is wrong with my child. People would say, wow, you're controlling his entire life. Well, I think we weren't controlling enough. Dad is not giving up on you. I'm hard because I want you to be a better man than I am. I think I'm ready for college. I can't take life for granted. It feels so right. Just calling my name. There's nothing you can't do in this world. We back you up all the way. The Triumph Award goes to Shea Summers. This is just the beginning. Even through all the struggles, I feel like I'm going places. You should be proud. Michelle, I guess I'd like to talk. There's, there's quite a bit in, the, in this two-minute clip to, to digest. But one of the things that stood out for me is when the woman said that there's a disconnect here with the black boys in, in the school. Why? Why is there such a disconnect? Well, when she talks about the disconnect in the school, I think we're talking about a larger societal situation mm -hmm. that uh, she em exemplifies as, as a disconnect but that I would rather kind of uh, um, phrase as unconscious racism or implicit bias, um, which means, you know, attitudes and assumptions that we all internalize because of the racial hierarchy that exists about who our boys are, uh, about expectations 
uh, around uh, their intellectual capacity, around uh, sports, around criminality. And we see that reflected in all institutions, in the criminal justice system, and in this case, in the education system. So this disconnect that she talks about is really about a larger societal issue, about our attitudes towards our boys. And really, the question is, how can we best support them so they can confront these questions of, uh, of uh, assumptions about them, but also feel good about themselves in the process. Why did you want to do this film? Why? Did, <laughs> well, you know, um, Joe and I, which, who's my husband, also partner Joe filmmaking Brewster. with Joe Brewster, filmmaking uh, uh, partner and husband, we were filmmakers before uh, this journey started with the school. And when we entered, uh, when our son entered the kindergarten uh, program, um, he was part of this diversity initiative that the school was engaged in and had a mission to really create a more multicultural student environment that reflected New York City more. Now, uh, we had never been to school in the elite institutions such as uh, Dal Dalton, and we thought that this would be an interesting story for us to capture, capture this diversity in action, to see what kind of challenges, but also what kind of advantages this could present. Um, we had the two boys involved, the two families, but there were also girls involved involved initially of different racial and ethnic backgrounds and socioeconomic status. But as we moved along in the process, um, the girls eventually dropped out of the film, and we were left with our son Idris and Shayon, uh, the Summers family. And in a way, this was a blessing in disguise, because what we realized is we had actually embarked on this question of the African-American male achievement gap and the relationship of our boys to education and how do families cope with that situation in whatever, envir whatever educational environment they find themselves in. So what's the takeaway? Well, I think part of the takeaway has to do with uh, the need for us to understand the resilience of our boys and support them both socially and emotionally, but also the need to raise the bar and the standards and expectations that we all have for them. Um, the question that this issue of unconscious racism is something that we all internalize and biases we all internalize in this so-called post-racial society. And um, that if we talk about it, it's a first step to really um, making things better. That it's ju not just about making the environment better for minority students, but that by talking about race, we are, are bettering the entire society and the entire community. You know, the, the other thing that caught my attention was uh, one of the boys, the other boy's mom said that she doesn't know, she's not comfortable around white people, mm -hmm. and she wants her son to be comfortable around white people. That's kind of a powerful statement considering uh, six years ago, we were talking about post-racial America. Yeah, I mean, the reality is we are far from anything that's post-racial. Uh, we're living in, in a situation, and as parents, we have to navigate an environment where, yes, we can uh, aspire and hope our kids can even achieve uh, the presidency, but at the same time, we have to confront biases in the street, and there's the potential of, 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 of death, such as with Trayvon Martin. So we have to navigate that, that continuum as parents and how do we best prepare them. And we know that uh, even amongst, you know, uh, uh, students and, and uh, boys who are in middle class environments, race still plays a big role sure. in how they feel about themselves and the potential that so they how, can achieve. How has the movie been received in, in the U.S.? I know you were overseas promoting it. Uh, how, how, what kind of dialogue has it spurred? I have to say that we can barely keep up with the demand. Ever since our award at Sundance, which was a little over a year ago, we've had over 1,200 community screening requests across the country, and internationally it's growing as well. And so we're traveling a lot. Um, it's being embraced by many school districts um, and by administrations who are involved in education. Um, it's being embraced uh, by educators to really kind of delve deep to find solutions in the classroom and how expectations influence classroom dynamics, and most importantly, other parents. They're seeing their experience validated through the film, and we're engaging in conversations where we can actually support each other, um, share information about how best to support our boys. We have a very robust community engagement campaign that includes work that we're doing with the Open Society Institute's Campaign for Black Male Achievement. They're supporting our 
our work. They're involved with uh, President Obama's uh, Brothers Keeper Initiative. And um, through this support, we're able to have really in-depth conversations, but also provide tools. Mm -hmm. um, we've published a book called Promises Kept, Raising Black Boys to Succeed in School and in Life, that calls information from over 50 experts mm -hmm. around the country on education and black male achievement, and uh, lessons learned from us and other families across the country that can be shared with other parents. Because we really feel that it has to start with the family unit. Um, being able to feel empowered and an agency to create certain changes within our spheres of influence. The Annie E. Casey Foundation uh, and, a, and a study on um, black children, um, it, it concluded that uh, the potential for overall success for African-American children is, is really bleak. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we had the, the story of this uh, young man who got accepted into all eight Ivy League schools. Uh, where are we in terms of uh, black, educating black children? Why is it such a challenge in this country? Well, this is where it gets very complicated and where uh, the crux of what we try to do is, is uh, really emphasize the need to talk about race and implicit bias that exists. Because uh, if you look at the statistics, that particular study from the little that I've read so far, you know, looks at the gap that exists for lower income um, students of color. But as you go up the socioeconomic ladder, that gap actually increases. Yeah, so if you look at similarly situated middle class, upper middle class white and black families, the gap in performance is wider. So it's not necessarily about comparing yourself to uh, other black students in other places, but what, are, what, what kind of performance is happening along the same economic uh, uh, indicator. And what we see is really that race still plays a role and that it's complicated because we see that opportunity is not just the only uh, uh, factor and that it's really necessary to talk. Well, unfortunately, we had a time to talk some more about this. Michelle Stevenson, thank you for joining us. Thank you. The book Promises Kept that documents Stevenson's findings is available on Amazon.com. For more information about the film, you can go to the website AmericanPromise.org. Still to come on the show, the grave consequences of how Latinos are sometimes portrayed in the media. Before that, Abby Ashola has some other news. Thanks, Sarah. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. Plans are afoot to level the building that houses a controversial mosque near Ground Zero. Arab American News reports that a New York City real estate developer has put in an application to demolish the four-story Tribeca building along with another nearby property. In the past, the owner, Sharif El Gamal, made plans to revamp the building into a $100 million 13-story Islamic community center. But many protested the idea, claiming that having it so close to ground zero would be insensitive. El Gamal recently commented, saying he has no specific plans for the site. But according to NYUCurb.com, he's considering building condominiums. From DNAInfo.com, Mayor Bill de Blasio is promising that hundreds of reimbursement checks would be issued to Hurricane Sandy victims by the end of summer. Mr. de Blasio's newly appointed Office of Recovery and Resiliency drafted a report that recommends ways to speed up and increase the response to the damage left behind by the devastating 2012 hurricane. So far, the city has constructed eight homes in Brooklyn and Staten Island. The city has also promised to begin rebuilding up to 500 homes under its newly revamped Build It Back program. New York City community boards may be getting a facelift. City Council members Ben Kalos and Jimmy Vaca recently introduced Resolution 164 that would subject community board members to term limits. Community boards are currently allowed to set their own term limits on officers. The new rule would set a mandatory five consecutive two-year term limit for board members. The Brooklyn Eagle reports that those who sponsor the resolution say they want to create inclusive, apolitical boards that truly represent communities. And finally, Indian filmmakers and enthusiasts are gearing up for the 14th annual New York Indian Film Festival. News India Times describes the event as the oldest, most prestigious Indian film festival in the United States. The festival will open with a film titled Ugly by renowned filmmaker Anurag Kashyap. The movie depicts the disappearance of an aspiring actor's 10-year-old daughter. 
The event will run from May 5th to the 10th at various locations, including NYU's Skirball Center for Performing Arts. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. There are increasing complaints from Latinos that mainstream media does a poor job of representing the diversity in their community, as well as often misrepresenting them as illegal, illiterate, or inept. Latinos Beyond Real is a documentary that tries to address the impact this has on Hispanics, especially a younger generation. Gary Pierre Pierre spoke with one of the and film's the producers, begin, Edwin Pagan, so about how he is challenging um, a media stereotype. Edwin Pagan, before we start this conversation, let's take a look at the clip. There were all these things that my parents showed me and that I didn't get to see on, on television, which was dignity, Latinos with dignity. <laughs> <laughs> you want me? 60 pesos. A lot of unconscious racism exists because these type of images, these type of perceptions, these type of values have existed so long. They are the norm. Sometimes the director says, wow, no, he's more street, you know? He's like, don't like this. He don't like this, man. to still keep popping up. I don't go to Rica. I'll be great at some drugs. <laughs> Pretty heavy stuff there, Edwin. Yeah, it uh, sure is. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with these negative stereotypes as a filmmaker? Yeah, the best way that we found to do it is to turn them on their head. So the, the documentary itself doesn't offer any answer. It's really about creating a conversation and a dialogue. Uh, the same as we're having here because what happens is we take these images for granted i mean if you look even at the cartoons that we we talk about in the film you for the most part you say well what's wrong with that until you really look at them and you strip away how people are being portrayed the accents that they get when they're a certain type of character and so when you really start doing a little bit of media media analysis and, and media literacy you start realizing that they are full of stereotypes that they are and for the most part kind of making fun of a, a particular class of people. In this case, we were focusing on how Latinos were portrayed, the same as happened in the uh, African-American community, Asian community still does. And um, so we thought the best way was just to put it out there raw. Um, and that's how you'll see it in the documentary. Do you see this as a uh, point blank racism, bigotry, or is this a rite of passage that every immigrant groups or minority groups in this country undergo something similar. If you look at the Irish, the German, the Polish, they all had, you know, jokes and stereotypes about them. And, and, and now it's the blacks' turns and the Latinos' turn yeah. to, be, to be picked on, if you I will. I think to some degree that has happened to almost any culture that's, you know, assimilated into New York for a period of time. But unlike most of those other cultures, European cultures, they happened for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And since then, they've, they've sort of evaporated. Latinos have been here for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so when 100 years we're still being portrayed that way on TV, it's not acceptable anymore. Um, and given the fact that you know we're, we're in an age where people are trying very hard on many fronts to kind of dismiss these stereotypes and these labels. Mm -hmm. And when they keep popping up, you, you have to ask the question, why? Is it because people are ignorant in the, in the sense that they don't, they're in an insular community and don't interact, so all they're seeing is feeding what they already know from the images that are portrayed on television, or is it racism? You know, that's that's basically the question. Well, then let's answer that question. Yeah. Well, I think to some degree it is because if you look at it, and every year you have these big uh, things that blow up in a network's face because some show does one of these kind of stereotypical portrayals, and everybody protests. You would think that they would learn, right? Uh, there, there, there's a one thing that we tackle in the in the program in the documentary, which is PBS. Uh, you know, Ken Burns, per se. Um, when the, the long-running series came out, the miniseries, 14 hours, not 
no Latinos were portrayed as which having mini, which the baseball series. Okay. Uh, and no Latinos were portrayed in it as having contributed to that. And, and, and you know. You gotta be kidding me. No, I am not <laughs> kidding. And then they came out. Roberto Clemente was not in there? None of them were in there. You know, they just uh, uh, mentioned some statistics and so forth. And that was it. And there was a big uproar about that. But, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, and they have a big miniseries, Ken Burns again, uh, on World War II. No Latinos in it. No Native Americans in it. You know, and you have to question where are they doing this research? You know, so it, I, you, sometimes you gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta fall on the side that it's not a mistake. Because how can you say there was no Latinos in baseball? How can you say that Latinos or Native Americans didn't contribute to fighting the World War II when you know it? I mean, there's films out even called Wind Talkers, which was about the Native Americans contributing in a very significant way to that. And it's omitted. So you have to say, to some degree, that there's some sort of, like, you know, inert racism. You know, one thing that, that, that caught my attention was in the clip when that young lady said, you know, it's just a lack of dignity. Right. Uh, and and how, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, the thing is that you, you, like we are, you stand up for it, you say it's not right, it's not true, it's false. Uh, one of the things that we cover in the documentary is not just how we've been portrayed in film and television. We also talk about how news coverage starts covering people. And we talk about studies through the the... UCLA and others that show that there are certain buzzwords that are continually used, uh, you know, uh, pack, pack, crossing the frontier in packs, uh, you know, just, just keywords that are used to kind of label folks. The same way that when you invade a country, when you're about to invade Iraq, Afghanistan, what's the first thing that happens? They ramp up this sort of propaganda machine About the that dictator who's the worst person in the world. And just flip it on its head so that we are desensitized to the culture. And not only that, but that at one point we also hate the culture. So that when the war does begin, we're not sort of looking at them as human beings, but other. And I think that's what happens in a lot of these things. So with immigration, for instance, you'll see that that's what's been happening the last five, ten years, where all of a sudden, Everything that's wrong with the United States, oh, it's immigration. It's these people crossing the border, which is not necessarily true. You know, what's the impact of all of this on the younger generation of Latinos? How are they uh, proce processing all of this negativity? Well, the thing I think um, it does, it does, when you come into a country for the first time and you're trying to assimilate and all you hear on the news or on television are jokes, you're the butt of a joke or you're this other that supposedly is causing chaos when you know you just came here to have a better life. You know, it can be demeaning. What, 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 the good thing that I'm seeing in the last couple of years is that you have a lot of young-minded people going to college and breaking out of that kind of mentality and saying, listen, you can say what you want, but I'm accomplishing the American dream as anyone else. And you can say what you want, you can say what you will, but, you know, here's the proof in the pudding. I didn't come here to steal cars. I didn't come here to rape or pillage. I came here, the same as everyone else, to follow the American dream. And there are a lot of young people that are, you know, are breaking those boundaries by just educating themselves and moving forward into society. Well, let's leave it on that positive note. Edwin Pagan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You can watch the film and learn more about this campaign at latinosbeyondreal.com. When we come back, helping foreign entrepreneurs set up shop in New York City's emergent technology sector. From us, Venture Out New York is a niche company that specializes in promoting and helping bring foreign technology companies to New York City. The company's clientele has grown rapidly as the Big Apple begins to rival Silicon Valley in San Francisco as a hub for technology startups. I found out more about this company that helps these startups get started in the city that never sleeps. Do you know what this is called? No. It's called bread. Bread? Did you try it? Yeah, I did. And did you become full of energy? I did! How did you know? I'll explain to you. Nutri Ventures is an animated television series that got started in Portugal in 2010. It was created by Rui Lima Miranda 
and his partner, Rodrigo Carvalho. The story is set in a magical kingdom where eating healthy foods give children superpowers. The show is also available on a digital platform where children can interact with their heroes while taking quizzes about nutrition. Children don't, they don't make a difference between what is healthy and not healthy. For them, it's a totally different paradigm. When you tell them, hey, do you want you know, this healthy food which has the, you know, the endorsement of FIU or the Gugas, or you want this unhealthy food without any sponsoring in that. And they will yeah. choose this one, and we have data proving that. Theo and Guga are two of NutriVentures' heroes who made a big splash on the international scene in 2013. Since then, the animation series revenue grew by 75 percent. So the obvious next stop for NutriVentures was to take their adventures to the United States. Because it is the largest uh, market in terms of entertainment, licensing, and digital uh, in the digital market. So. We know that if we are able to succeed here, we'll be able to succeed everywhere else in the, in the world. The logistics of bringing a successful international startup to the U.S. proved difficult. That's where Brian Frumberg and his company Venture Out New York came in. We find these early stage promising companies that are planning U.S. expansion, ready to do it, have some capital back home, have some traction with their product, by our estimation, are ready to raise, ready to expand and grow in as quickly, uh, yeah, as quickly as possible. Fromberg started the company after a brief interaction with the Canadian consulate in 2011. Back then, he attempted to help new Canadian companies land startup capital. After realizing the process was tedious and complicated, he decided to create a special niche and become the ultimate middleman for foreign companies. We found out uh, through friends in Portugal and so when we were here for a week, we were able to attend some meetings, like the ones I was telling you, that they were helping you to know how to, pe uh, how, how to, to pitch your business to, to American investors, or meeting the right PR firm, or meeting the accounting firm. So this is kind of a welcome pack. That welcome pack is part of the one-week accelerator program Frumberg has spent the last three years developing. He relies on word of mouth, venture capital incubators, co-working spaces and universities to select candidates for the course. It's people like that, it's, you know, founders of Google from Russia that are, that are building these great, inspiring companies that are changing the world. Since its launch in September 2012, Venture Out New York has helped establish about 100 companies from more than 10 different countries. That's thanks in part to Frumberg's drive and to New York becoming the second largest tech hub in the United States behind Silicon Valley in San Francisco. But what's happened in New York over the last five years has been transformative in terms of uh, the growth of uh, the technology community here, the amount of dollars invested, deals done, and what sits below that is this tremendously uh, vibrant, innovative, burgeoning community that has grown exponentially over an extremely short period of time. NutriVentures has been able to ride that wave of growth and recently became an official partner of Let's Move, First Lady Michelle Obama's healthy initiative for children. You have no idea how different and, and positive it is versus uh, Europe. When you do this kind of move and you, and you have to integrate easily, you really hope, you're hoping to have an um, open society welcoming and easy to, you know, to make business happen. In six months, we moved far more in the U.S. than we have done in, like, say, one year and a half in two European countries that we are working on. NutriVentures is just one of Frumberg's success stories. He hopes to eventually parlay that into a business that will provide funding capital for some of the brightest emerging technology companies trying to get a foothold in New York. For Independent Sources, I'm Sarah Pizon. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.